Thank you for watching The Word and Sword. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. Call 828-465-3009, and one of our members will be happy to talk to you. That's 828-465-3009. In this episode of The Word and Sword, we examine four lessons from the Bible. Our first study focuses on Christ as we continue in examination of His temptation as recorded in Matthew 4. We discuss how Jesus responded to each of the three temptations put before Him. His example shows us how to resist our adversary and win the battle over sin. The second segment is a detailed study of that day or, as it is often described, the day of judgment. For some, it will be a day of grief and doom. For others, the final day will be one of deliverance and glory. What does the Bible actually say will occur on that day? Stay tuned and dive into this fascinating study with us. Next, we look at the basic Bible doctrine regarding our adversary, that serpent of old, Satan. We look at where he came from, his character, the tools he uses against us, and his final doom. This lesson is designed to inform us about the devil so we are better equipped to resist him. Finally, we study a lesson from the New Testament as we focus on the parable of the tares. This is a parable and lesson that ought to drive us to have a greater commitment to Christ and his gospel as we look forward to his return. Again, we thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828-465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. Call during the program to connect live with one of our members or call anytime, leave a message, and we will get back to you. You may also leave a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword or send us an email at contact at word and sword dot com again that email address is contact at word and sword dot com right now we invite you to grab your bible to study with us and call 828-465-3009 with your bible questions still be The Bible teaches Jesus was tempted to sin in Matthew chapter 4. We understand that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. When we study this account, some of the things we learn from this is, first of all, that we are to expect temptation. It is going to come in our lives if the Son of God himself was tempted in his lifetime, we know that we are going to be tempted in our lifetime. So we have to prepare for that temptation. Also, something else we understand is that there are three avenues of temptation, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And each one of those have their own unique challenges, and maybe some more than others depending on who we are. Maybe one avenue is a stronger avenue of temptation or a particular weakness of ours through our habit, our life, or whatever it may be. And then we understand also that we can resist temptation just as Jesus resisted the temptation of the devil. And what we want to do in this study is look a little bit closer at resisting temptation. How is it that Jesus resisted that temptation? What are the principles that he used? Well, when we study this, we can use those same principles to thwart the attacks of the devil so that we are not taken away by him and we continue to please and to honor our Lord and Savior. So let's study in Matthew chapter 4. First of all, let's look at this idea that man shall not live 
by bread alone. In Matthew 4, verses 2 and 3, we see this first temptation as recorded here. It says, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We remember that Jesus was hungry because he had fasted for 40 days. So this temptation that he's facing is a very real temptation, has an intense hunger. His body is craving food, craving nourishment. So when the devil came to him and told him, turn these stones to bread, it was a very real temptation. We remember that Jesus, though he was God, he was also man. In John chapter 1, it talks about the word how that the word became flesh. And so there were times when Jesus was tired, times when he was weary from his journey and he was thirsty, or like this, times when he was hungry and particularly very hungry because of the fasting he had experienced. So when he's faced with the temptation, he responded to the devil, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he looked to the scripture in order to answer the temptation, in order to defeat the devil on this occasion. So what this is telling us is that we have to put the spiritual over the material. In John chapter 6, you remember that the Lord had fed thousands of people on this occasion. And he dismissed the people. He went to the other side of the lake. The people then followed him to the other side of the lake because they wanted more food. Now, in John 6, verse 26, Jesus answers these people and rebukes them for having the wrong attitude, having the wrong focus in life. He said in John 6, verse 26, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So these people came to Jesus not because of the miracles and not because of the miracles, what they were saying or what they were pointing to, the fact that he was indeed the son of God, the savior of the world, but they were coming to him because they wanted their bellies filled again. They wanted more food. So the Lord rebuked them and admonished them here, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Keep your focus on spiritual things. Keep your focus on heaven. But they weren't doing that. But the Lord in his temptation, when the devil came to him and told him, turn the stones to bread, the Lord kept his focus on spiritual things. And he made a declaration here that man's existence is dependent on God, not on material things. So he is telling us that we are to serve God and not mammon. In fact, he made that very statement really in Matthew chapter six in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So our time, our energy, our money needs to be going primarily to serve God and not to simply heap up riches and wealth and things in this life. We have to have a willingness to endure hardship for the sake of the Lord, not just making sacrifices in order to get more, to have more money, to have a bigger house, to have cars and find things and toys and to do things that are fun or recreational life. Those all have their place, but we need to make sure we're putting our priority on serving God. And we need to live, as Jesus said here, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Matthew chapter 28, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, this is what he told his disciples. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." So he tells him, you go out, you teach the people, you baptize them, making them my disciples, and then you teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Not some of the things that I have commanded you, but all things that I've commanded you. We are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We are to respect God's law on marriage as well as modesty. We need to respect his teachings on Christ as well as the church. You see, some people approach the Bible with the attitude they can pick and choose the parts they want to keep and which ones they want to ignore. And there are some people who think, well, as long as I keep most of what the gospel says, well, there's some things I can kind of let slide because at least I've done most of what God has said. But the Lord declared we are to live by every word that proceeds in the mouth of God. So it's like this. There are some people who say, well, I need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. I need to repent of my sins. I need to freely confess before men that Jesus is the Son of God and not be ashamed of confessing that, but I'm not going to be baptized. I've done most of it, but I'm not going to do all of it. So there are people who say, well, I'll live by most of what God says, but not all of what God says. There are some people who have this idea, well, I'm not going to be filled with lusts. I'm not going to be a drunkard. I'm not going to use filthy language. But, you know, sometimes I have a temper, I get angry, and I lose that temper. So they'll keep many things in the Word of God, but they'll reserve that anger to themselves. Well, that's just as much as sin that will condemn us to lose our souls as if we didn't keep any of the word of God. Because Jesus said we are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that is important to note that it is from the mouth of God. As 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We are to listen to the word of God, to what God tells us, not listening to men You know, we're not to turn to the wise men of this age or of ages past, to, you know, Lincoln or Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin, to philosophers like Plato or Socrates, men like that. We're not to to listen to these men who give their own philosophy of life or their own twist on the philosophy of life but we are to listen to the word of God. And anything we hear from men, we need to go back and filter it through the word of God. Does it agree with what the Lord teaches? Because again, Jesus said, we are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and not by the things of this world, not from the philosophies of men in this world. One of the points we want to get real quick before we leave this first temptation and Jesus' response to that is a lack of bread does not mean a lack of love from God. Jesus fasted. He didn't have the bread, but God still loved him. Just like Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, he was a poor man full of sores. He was a beggar. So he lived from the crumbs of the rich man's table, but God still loved him. And because we may not have the material things that others have in this life, doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. That is a false concept that is promoted by many religious leaders. They they say, well, you know what? If you truly love God and you truly devote yourself to God, well, then you're going to have all the abundance of this life that this life has to offer. That is utterly false. We might have material goods, while we love God, but we might not. 
Just like the beggar Lazarus didn't have this world's goods, Jesus was a poor man himself, born in a manger, a son of a carpenter. Jesus told his disciples at one point, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He was a poor man, but God still loved him. And just because we may not have much doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. We are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and not by material things or bread alone. The next thing we want to notice is that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, The devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, you shall, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So the devil challenged Jesus to challenge God. Challenge Jesus to challenge or test God. The Lord's response in verse 7 was, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You know, in times past, God's people tempted him, tested him, tried him. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt, they were crossing the desert and they complained because they had no water. And one of the things they said in the, their complaint was, is the Lord among us or not? So they were saying, does God really love us? Does God really care about us or not? Why has he led us into this desert and we have no water? So does the Lord love us or not? And when we say things like, if you love me, God, you'll give me a car. If you love me, God, you'll heal my mother and she'll get better. We're testing God. We're tempting God. We're trying God. We're challenging God to prove his love to us. To tempt God is to doubt his word and to doubt his love. And that is sinful. That's wrong. Because we, as God's creatures, are challenging our creator to prove his word, to prove himself. We're trying to force the hand of God to manipulate and to coerce him into showing and to proving his word and his will. We are trying to set the terms and conditions on which God shows his love instead of letting God set the terms and conditions on which he shows his love for us. And that's what the devil's doing with Jesus here. He's saying, you know, if God really loves you, just throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and make God prove that he loves you. you. You need to test that. You need to really find out whether or not he loves you. And that was a sinful thing. We don't set the terms. God sets the terms on which he is going to express his love and his care for us in our life. We have to have faith. We have to have faith that God truly does care about us and follow his word and do his will regardless of the circumstances in our life. We should not try to force the hand of God by creating a crisis, but we should trust him when that crisis comes, when the trouble comes, whatever that trouble may be, instead of trying to create something in the conditions where God has to prove himself to us. Then again, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, remember that the devil had come to Jesus and he had taken him up on a high mountain. And when he set him up on that high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. You know, Jesus here stated that God alone is worthy of worship. He is due our praise and honor and obedience and no one else. So we are to worship God. In our lives, we are either going to serve God or we are going to serve Satan. We're going to worship God and honor him or we are going to give our honor to the devil. In Romans chapter 16, verse, or rather Romans 6, 
verses 16 to 18, it says this, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So we are either slaves to righteousness, which is to God, or we are slaves to death, to the devil, to sin, to unrighteousness. And we are to make sure in our lives that we are serving God and worshiping God. If we do not worship God as he directs, then that means that we are not glorifying God. If God is not glorified in our worship, then Satan is happy. Serving Satan, we understand, may bring us the world. Remember in Mark chapter 8, Mark 8 verses 36 and 37, Jesus made this statement, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So in theory, we could serve the devil and gain the whole world. We can enjoy all the pleasures, all the lust. We can gain all the riches. We could live daily in ecstasy, so to speak, and gain the whole world, but lose our own soul. So in serving Satan, it may bring us the world, but it is going to cost us our soul in eternity. Serving God and doing his will will make us joint heirs with Christ. The devil will give us things in this life, but God is going to give us eternal life. And so we ought to be focused on being joint heirs with Christ. And while the devil lays the world before us, we need to resist just as Jesus did and recognize we are to worship and to serve God alone and no other, no matter what the inducement may be, that we serve our Lord. You know, if we trust God, if we respect him and we stand for his truth, we can overcome the devil and all of his temptations. Our Savior showed us the way in Matthew chapter 4 as he faced temptation in a very trying period of his life. He walked the path before us, and he walks the path with us. And ultimately, he gave his pure and perfect life so that we can overcome the devil, so we can be free of our sins. As those who seek to please God, we need to live by the word of God. We need to not doubt God's love for us at any time, and we need to solely worship him regardless of what is offered to us by our adversary. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, a non-denominational group of Christians devoted to following the New Testament as the sole authority for our beliefs and practices. If you live in the area, we invite you to visit our services and get to know us. We have members who drive 45 minutes to an hour one way to assemble with us. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, it says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, 
For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. The term that day appears eight times in the New Testament, and it, of course, is a reference to the judgment day or a great day of reckoning between God and man. There is a vivid summary of that day given toward the end of the book of Revelation. The book details in visions and signs and symbols the defeat of the Roman Empire and the triumph of the cause of Christ. And toward the end of it here, the Apostle John, through the visions he's received, gives us a glimpse of the future return of Christ and the complete and utter downfall of Satan and his power to destroy man and work in this world. So in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 beginning, we see the final and full defeat of our great adversary. It says this, now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This description here of that day, of the day of judgment, is one of doom or it's one of deliverance. It's one of grief or it's one of glory. It's one of fear or it's one of faith. The difference between whether it's doom or deliverance, grief or glory, fear or faith, is submission to God or rebellion toward him. In this description in the book of Revelation, it lays out many different things that are going to occur on that day. It talks about the devil being defeated and being cast off into that lake of fire and brimstone. It talks about this great throne that is in heaven and the dead, small and great, standing before God, those books being opened up.
and men being judged by what is written in those books. And then it talks about the destruction of death and of Hades. And it talks about how that there are those who will enter into a joyous existence in the presence of God where there's no sorrow, no crying, nor tears. But then there is also those who are going to end up in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone because of the sins which they have committed in this life. We want to take some time in our study and look at that day and go through the details of what the New Testament tells us what will occur on that day. So to begin with, we think about the fact that on that day, Christ will appear suddenly. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and read the first several verses here to notice the return of Christ will be a surprise to all of mankind. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know that perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So it says the return of Christ is going to be like a thief in the night. In other words, it's going to be a surprise to those who are on earth when Jesus appears. He's going to come without warning. And there is going to be no preventing his return. We're not going to be able to stop that no matter what we do. There's going to be no avoiding his return. In other words, everyone is going to be a part of this experience of the return of Christ. And therefore, we understand that it could be at any moment because it's like a thief in the night then he could appear at any moment, even while we are discussing this very topic at this very hour. And no one knows the day or the hour that this will occur. If you notice in Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 down through 44, this is after Jesus has discussed the destruction of Jerusalem, and he's laid out for his disciples to look for signs when the destruction of Jerusalem was about to happen. But notice what he says in Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So you understand that that coming of the Son of Man is going to be a surprise. And it says here that no one knows the hour or the day on which he's going to return. Not even the angels know that. He goes on to note this in verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You know, there are so many people out there who have been convinced that there are going to be certain signs that tell them that the Lord is about to return at any moment, at any time now. And through history, people have predicted when Jesus is going to come back. And they've said, well, look at what's happening in the world. Look what's happening in the nations. Look what's happening with sickness throughout the world. Look what's happening with upheaval and wars and earthquakes and natural disasters and the things that are going on in the stars and the sun and the moon. And they, they've said, well, that's a sign that Jesus is going to return at any moment. And they've all come up false because the Lord says here, 
As he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that we don't know when that's going to happen. There are not going to be any signs when the Lord is going to return. He's told us he's going to return. He's told us we need to be ready. We need to be waiting and prepared for when he comes back. There are many people who have misapplied the teachings on the destruction of Jerusalem and other historical events in the Bible and that have happened and applied them wrongly to the return of Christ. God alone knows when Christ is going to come back. God alone knows that day of judgment, and it's utterly futile for us to try to predict when that is going to happen. Our duty, our responsibility is simply to live in a way that we are ready for that day to occur. Now, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and notice what is going to happen when the Lord comes back. There are certain things that are going to occur. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 beginning, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. He's going to return, it says, with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, there's going to be an audible experience when Jesus comes back. You know, there are people today who believe, well, Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be this thing called the rapture, which there's no word like that in the Bible. And it's going to be quiet. It's going to be unknown. Well, here it tells us when the Lord comes back, it's going to be blared out through the world with a shout, <clears throat> with a trumpet, with a voice of an archangel. And he is going to return, it says here, with his angels. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, notice what it says as well about this. It says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be admired or to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So you see that the Lord is going to come back with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance. All people are going to see it and all people are going to hear it. And he's going to return with 12, at least 12 legions of angels, as the Lord talked about in Matthew chapter 26. So let's understand this. The return of Christ will be overwhelming. There will be no mistaking about what is occurring, what is happening. There's going to be no escaping it. No matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, no matter if we build bunkers or anything else like that, there's not going to be any escape of it. There's not going to be any resisting it. No matter what we might personally do or what the nations of men might do to try to stop it, to try to prevent it, there's going to be no resisting the return of Christ and the angels who are with him. And there's not going to be any missing it. We're going to know when Jesus returns. Now, when Jesus does return, the dead will be raised and they will be changed if you notice in John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus makes an interesting statement here in John 5, verse 28. He says, Do not marvel at this. 
For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All the dead will be raised. It says they will hear his voice. You know, that's like the shout that's mentioned over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The shout, the voice of an archangel will be sounded out. So they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God as he calls men out of the grave. They're going to be raised from the graves, from their caskets, from the tombs and the caves on land and on sea. They're going to be raised, all the people from Abel to Noah who survived the flood and all those who perished in the flood. From Moses, whose body was buried by the hand of God, to David, who was in tomb with the kings in Jerusalem. From Stephen and James, who were martyred by the enemies of God, to John, who died as an aged soldier of the cross. All saints and all sinners who died from the dawn of creation to the last soul who crosses the chilly waters of death before the Son of God appears again. All souls will be called out of Hades and be reunited with their earthly remains and changed. In 1 Thessalonians, or rather 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about this change that is going to occur. In 1 Thessalonians, or rather 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35, it says this, But someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what, do you, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another flesh of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, and but the glory of the terrestrial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. The, that is, the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So, all these different bodies were made by God, and He made the bodies to be suitable for their purpose and for their environment, like the animals, the birds, the fish, the celestial bodies, the bodies that are out there in the heavens, the, the stars, the comets, all those things. God has made those appropriately for where they exist and what they are to do. But he talks about this resurrection body, and there's a question at Corinth, well, how is it that men are going to be changed? How is it that, you know, that body that goes into the ground and decays, how is that going to be brought back? We, we don't understand that. Well, notice what he says in verse 41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and one star differs from another. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So there's a natural body that is put into the ground when we are buried. And there's a spiritual body that will be raised up when the Lord returns. Now, they are related to one another, but they're not exactly the same. Just as he talked about, you know, there is this seed that's put into the ground. And when it's in the ground, it dies, so to speak, and then it germinates, and there's a plant that grows up. So you think about a kernel of corn that's put into that ground, and then that corn stalk grows up, and it buds out, and there's ears of corn. So you have one thing that's planted, and another thing that comes up, they're related to each other. And notice that the one that comes up is greater in glory than the one that went down into the ground. And so it will be with our body that's put into the ground. The spiritual body that comes up will be greater than the one that went into the ground, though it is related. And it will be suited for an eternal existence. Now notice down in 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why there needs to be a resurrection body, a different body. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He says we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We might say in the snap of our fingers. Won't it be amazing when that occurs? And let me ask you, what if we're alive when that takes place? If we haven't died and the Lord returns and we're near a graveyard? what kind of scene that might be. You know, right now we are a body, a spirit, and a soul. We're a body and we have life and we have an eternal soul that is dwelling within us. This body is a tent and the soul that we have is who we really are. That's us. And that is the part that is going to survive into eternity, but given a new body to live and exist in eternity when the Lord returns. The Bible then tells us, then comes the end, the end of the existence of this universe. If we go back to Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20 again, where the apostle Paul, or rather the apostle John fast forwards from the first century and predicting the destruction of the Roman Empire to Satan's final overthrow and final defeat. In Revelation 20, verse 7, again, it says this, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So at the end, the devil is going to be cast into that lake of fire We struggle now with our adversary. We fight him day by day. But our adversary's full and final defeat is going to come on that last day, that day of judgment and reckoning with God. And he is going to be tormented forever and ever. He will pay and suffer for his rebellion against God and his role in deceiving men to rebel against God as well. And it's at this point that the universe will be rolled up or folded up like a garment as Hebrews chapter 1 talks about. Notice the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 1 verse 10 says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. Deity is unchanged. Deity has existed forever. Deity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, always have been. And there's going to be no change there. There is going to be a change In the material universe, these heavens will perish. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter gives a description of what's going to happen on that day. And he talks about how the earth is going to be destroyed and the heavens will be destroyed in 2 Peter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So this universe we understand it's going to be done away with. The universe as it exists now 
declares the existence of God and declares God's glory. And it is filled with wonder and amazement. And we are here to observe it and to behold it in awe. And God has given it to us in part to explore with intense curiosity, to see the wonders of his mighty creative hand. But the material universe that we see is great and as wonderful as it is, is going to be destroyed. Every nation and city, all political capitals, centers of commerce, every countryside village is going to be done away with. Skyscrapers and stadiums and statues, every hospital, every highway, every home is going to be done away with. Every ocean and every continent will disappear. The mountains and valleys and plains, the lakes and rivers and ponds, every rhino, raccoon and rat is going to be done away with will be dissolved, will be destroyed, every tree and flower and weed. In fact, every molecule of the dust and of the air will perish. They will vanish and cease to exist. And that tells us, my friend, that there is no eternal value in the material world around us. And that's why Jesus warned us about trading our soul four material things. In Mark 8, verse 36, he says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You understand that the Lord is warning us here. Do not trade your soul for anything. In fact, don't trade your soul for everything in the material universe because it's all going to be burned up. It's all going to perish. It's all going to disappear. And what's going to be left is you standing before the throne of God on the great day of judgment. Now, as we think about the fact that all men are going to be judged, we understand that this means that all nations are going to stand before God in the day of judgment. All nations in times past, all nations in the present, and all nations in the future. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then He shall sit on the throne of His glory. All nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Christ is sitting on His throne here. He's sitting in the judgment seat, and all men are before Him, and all men are going to give an account to Him. As 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, we're going to give an account to Him for all the deeds we've done in the body, whether good or bad. We'll give an account for all that we have done in this world. And the standard by which we are going to be judged is the Word of God. Notice in John chapter 12, John 12, verse 48. The Lord said this, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. The standard by which we're going to be judged is the word of God. In Revelation, where we read at the beginning about the description, about the books being open and another book being open, we understand we're going to have the book of God's Word open and then the book of our life, a record of our life. And one is going to be compared to the other. And if our life doesn't measure up to God's Word, then we are going to be found wanting. Our attitudes are going to be compared to what is taught in the Word of God. The words that we speak, in fact, Jesus said, for every idle word, men will give an account. So the things that we've said with great deliberation, great thought, are going to be judged. And the things that we've said in thoughtless idleness will be judged for those. And that is a scary thought because we say things we ought not. There's things we ought to keep to ourselves. But be that as it may, we're going to be judged for our attitudes, for our words, for our actions, the things that we do in this world. And it's sad, but the reality is that many people are going to be bewildered 
that they are found wanting before God. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you hear what Jesus is saying there? That on that day, the day of judgment, there will be people standing before him and pleading with him and saying, Lord, Lord, they acknowledge him as Lord. And they have acted in their life to please the Lord, at least an attempt to please him. And he says, I never knew you because you did not do the will of my father in heaven. They were lawless. They acted without law. They acted outside the word of God, which again, the word of God is our standard. And he says that there are going to be people who tried to please me, but they didn't live according to the standard that I laid out. And therefore, they're going to be rejected. They didn't live according to his word. They believed the lies of the devil. They followed their own feelings. And our feelings are not the standard. They had good intentions, but our good intentions are not the standard. And they had a clean conscience, but our conscience is not the standard. And so they're going to be standing there thinking they should receive a home in heaven, but be rejected by the Lord because they did not follow his will. The reality of the, the situation is they were in rebellion toward God, but they didn't realize it because they listened to the lies of the devil, to the false teachers who are out there. And so let's understand we need to be listening to the word of God and we need to follow the word of God because that is the standard by which we are going to be judged in the last great day. Now, the righteous will be separated from the unrighteous and each will be rewarded according to the way they have lived their lives. In 2 Thessalonians, again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses seven and following here when it talks about the return of Christ when he comes back with his mighty angels it says in verse eight second Thessalonians 1 verse 8 in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be admired or to be glorified, in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So there are those who believe in the Lord, who live to glorify him and admire him and loved him. And when he returns, they're going to glorify him and admire him and they're going to be rewarded. They're going to be blessed. They're going to be given a home in heaven. But there are others who it says did not know God and did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. They're going to be separated from the Lord because they were not prepared. They did not labor for the Lord. They did not help those who were in need in this life. And God will judge them and punish them for their sins. So what does that tell us? That tells us we need to give up our sin now. We need to turn away from unrighteousness now because the Lord is going to return at any moment. We don't know when that's going to be. And the destruction that he's going to bring will be sudden and there will be no changing it. But the righteous, the righteous will be given a crown of life. Let's notice James chapter 1 verse 12 where he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. To those who have resisted Satan's temptation, they're going to be given that crown of life. They've guarded their heart and their mind on a daily basis. They're going to be given a crown of life because they were willing to enter into this battle between good and evil, and they remain faithful to the end, as Paul writes about in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, the Lord's going to reward those who are brave and bold, who have gone out and fought the good fight, those who are willing to get dirty and bloodied, if you will. In that fight, they've been willing to go out and to suffer in the battle and face the consequences for living for the Lord when they have endurance and a commitment to finish to the end. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, Revelation 2, verse 10, as it's being discussed, the suffering that the saints faced in the first century, the church at Smyrna is being encouraged in this way. Revelation 2, verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, he's talking to people who are committed to a purpose that is greater than themselves. And you and I need to be committed to a purpose that is greater than us. That is to the purpose and to the cause of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need to be mentally prepared for the suffering and the sacrifice that comes with that so that we can endure to the end. We need to be a people who love the Lord and his truth more than life itself. Do you love the Lord? Do you want that crown of righteousness? Are you ready to do what it takes to prepare for that day of judgment? Because that is what it's going to take to have the victory in the end. In 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, let's read verses 53 through 58 as the Apostle Paul talks about this great victory. He says here, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do you want the victory? Do you want to overcome sin and Satan and be ready for the return of the Lord? Then we call on you to submit yourself wholly and fully to the will of the Lord. We ask you to sit down and study with us, to set aside the the traditions of men, set aside the doctrines and commandments that men have invented and taught, and simply open up the Word of God and study His Word. And let's study that together to see what the Scripture has to say so that you can be ready for that day. So we encourage you now to contact us, to set up a time for us to study together so that we together can know the will of God and look forward to the return of Christ. And until that time, we urge you, we encourage you to keep searching the scripture daily. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search word and sword TV program. Would you want to be friends with someone who lies to you, someone who tries to get you into trouble, or someone who rejoices when you are in pain? How about an individual that exploits your weaknesses against you and betrays you without remorse? 
The reality is we've all had a friend like this, and the sad reality is that we've all sought to have a friend like this. The Bible tells us about this so-called friend. In Revelation 9, this friend is described as Abdon and Apollyon, which means destruction and destroyer. In Revelation 12, it describes this friend as a dragon and a serpent. In chapter 13 of that same book, it describes this individual as the wicked one. Of course, we're talking about the devil, Satan, who is devoted and determined to destroy us, and he does it with great joy, with great glee, because he hates us. In this lesson, we want to explore Satan. What does the Bible say about Satan? Beginning with the idea of who is Satan, where did Satan come from? In John chapter 1, we want to understand a basic principle that's found in the Word of God a number of times, and something that we understand, I think, instinctively as people who believe in the Almighty God. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, that's a direct reference to the Son of God, or the second person of the Godhead, described here in John 1 as the Word. And the Word, it says, made all things. Without him, nothing was made that was made. But let's understand that the Lord did not create the devil as evil. The Lord doesn't create evil things. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it talks about that when he looked on all the creation of this universe, that everything was good. In fact, it was very good. But in 1 John chapter 1, Verse 5, let's also note this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God created all things, including the devil, but he did not create the devil as evil. So where did the devil come from? How did he come about? In Second Peter chapter 2, as well as in Jude, we see that the Bible indicates the devil was rebellious toward God, that the devil really was an angel that rebelled against God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare, and he goes on to talk about others he didn't spare, but the idea is that there were angels that rebelled against God. And that would be the explanation where the devil came from, that he was one of those angels that was right, but then ended up rebelling against God. In Jude verse 6, it says, and the angels who do not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So the idea is the devil was among this group that rebelled against God. And in fact, not just the idea that he was among this group, but that he was the leader of this group. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew 12, I want us to read verses 22 to 26 and notice where Jesus sort of points to this idea and the reality that the devil is the leader of these rebellious angels. In Matthew 12, verse 22, beginning, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So the Pharisees are pointing to Jesus and his power to have influence with demons as being the ruler of demons. So they were accusing Jesus of being the chief demon, the king demon, if you will. But verse 25 says this, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. 
How then will his kingdom stand? So you understand that the devil, as Jesus is describing him here, is a ruler over a kingdom. He has power. He has authority. Now, that power, that authority, if you will, is over the demons, over the other rebellious angels. So, yes, he is one who rebelled against God. Not that God created him as evil, but that he turned against God, did not submit to him, and led this rebellion of other angels. And so the Bible refers to him as being the head of these demons or being a king over his own kingdom, having a kingdom, having a sphere of authority and rule. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, it describes him as the God of this age. So he is one who is a cruel master and one who seeks to have influence in this world to cause men to rebel against God just as he led a rebellion of the other angels against God in the spiritual realm. And he's one who seeks to do destruction or to do harm, as we talked about, to all of us. Now, something we want to notice is the character of Satan. And maybe it is that we understand these things already, but we want to notice how it is that the Bible describes him so that we recognize the danger of being associated with him. First of all, let's understand that he is a liar and a deceiver. In John chapter 8, John 8 verse 44, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil is a liar, just like he lied to Eve. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, God had put Adam and Eve in the garden to tend and to keep it, and he had given them a command that they may eat of every tree of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil came along and he lied to Eve and told her that she would not die. God said they would die if they ate of that fruit, but the devil came along and said, they would not die. And he deceived Eve in that. And so she partook of the fruit and then she handed it to Adam and he partook of the fruit. And that just shows us the character of the devil. He's a liar. He will tell you a lie without remorse, knowing that that lie, when you believe it, when you follow it, when you accept it, is going to separate you from God is going to cause your soul to die. In Acts chapter 5, we see an account where Christians in the early church were influenced to lie. And this was the influence of the devil with them, and he tries to do the same thing to us. In Acts chapter 5, verse 1, it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and though, uh, threw a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price for yourself? So he was persuaded to lie by the devil. The devil is a liar and he wants us to lie. Why? Because when we do that, we're involved in evil and our soul is condemned before God and the devil rejoices in that. So the Bible admonishes us to put away lying. Don't have anything to do with that. No matter what the benefit you may see in the lying, to protect yourself, to build yourself up, to make others think you're someone that you're not or you have something you don't have. So the devil wants us to lie because his character is one of a liar. But then also in John 8, 44, we read where it said that the devil is a murderer. That is, he has hate to actually take life 
from others. That's what he wants to do. That's what he did with Cain and Abel. Remember that Cain and Abel both offered sacrifices to God in Genesis chapter 4. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's was rejected. And because of that, Cain was filled with hatred and envy toward his brother and he lured him out into a field and he murdered him. And then, of course, God confronted Cain about that. But the point we want to get at is that the devil persuaded Cain to murder his brother, Abel. We understand that the devil wants us to do the very same thing. And if it's not murder in reality, it's to treat our fellow man in a way that is hurtful and harmful to them, a way that is filled with hate and disgust and contempt. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, it says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so that same feeling an attitude of animosity, of hatred toward another, the Bible describes that's like you murdering that brother. Not that you actually have to commit the act, but if you just harbor that feeling, you are condemned just as though you did commit the act. And so the devil is a murderer because of his hatred, and we need to be careful not to be like that. He wants us to be hateful and hating one another, but we must resist that. The devil, of course, does all of this through temptation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, the apostle writes, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. The devil is a tempter. He tries to lure us away from God. He tries to get us to violate God's will. And he does that through lies in part, but also through persecution or intimidation. But he tempts us to commit sin, just as he could tempted Jesus to commit sin. In Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days, he tempted Jesus to commit sin. Of course, the Lord refused him in the temptations, and he overcame and he was pure and righteous and could be our sacrifice. But the devil tempted him and the devil tempts us. And the Bible's very clear about how the devil tempts us. In James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The idea is that we have desires within us, desires that we may naturally have, that God has put within us. It's a part of our being, but the devil wants us to fulfill them in a way that is contrary to God's will. And he comes along and he tempts us to get us to rebel against God. So he's a tempter because, as we said before, he wants us destroyed. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He tempts us because he wants to devour us. He wants us destroyed. He did this with Peter in tempting him to turn against the Lord, to deny that he knew the Lord. He does it to us on a daily basis, looking for that opportunity to destroy us because he is our adversary. He's our enemy. He is not our friend. He will lie to us and tell us he's our friend, but he is not our friend. Now, it's also interesting, as we briefly mentioned before, that the devil is also our accuser. In Revelation 12, 
Revelation 12, verse 10, says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The accuser. So here, let's draw that picture very clearly. The devil is our enemy, and he lies to us, and he tempts us to violate God's will. And when we violate God's will, he accuses us. He's the one pointing out, look, he has sinned, she has sinned. So he is our adversary, and he is our accuser. We do not need a friend like this. We need to avoid the devil, resist the devil, fight the devil, not allow him to have influence in our lives. Some of Satan's tools include obsessive sorrow for sin. One of the things he does to keep us trapped in sin is to cause us to be so overburdened by grief and sin that we don't want to do anything about it, that we are filled with hopelessness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, beginning, says, This punishment was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought to rather forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, the context of 2 Corinthians here is, in the first letter, Paul addressed the fact that there was a member at Corinth who had his father's wife. He was living in sexual immorality, and he told the brethren in the church there to withdraw from him, cast them out of their fellowship. Now, here in 2 Corinthians, that man has repented, and he's telling the brethren to receive him back. Let him know that you love him because there's a danger he'll be swallowed up with too much sorrow. That he'll have too much grief over his sin and not try to live righteously. He'll just give up. And he says that this is Satan's work. And this is Satan's tool, his device to keep us trapped in sin. So we can become so overwhelmed with sin that we don't try to do what's right. But we need to recognize that when we turn to the Lord and we submit to his will, we have forgiveness. And so, yes, there is grief over sin and we express godly sorrow that leads us to repentance, leads us to change our life, to get rid of that sin. But we don't allow that sin and the grief from that to keep us down, to hold us down, because in the Lord we have forgiveness that sin will be put away. The devil, of course, also uses persecution. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14 beginning, it says this, for you, brethren, became imitators of churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that we may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So he's talking about those at Thessalonica who loved the Lord, who were serving him, but they were being intimidated. They were being persecuted just as their brethren in Judea had been persecuted. So he says to them that they need to remain strong, that they re need to remain faithful. Again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, so just a little bit later, he says he was concerned about them and sent Timothy because the tempter had tempted them. He was concerned that the tempter had come to them and destroyed them or would take advantage of them and they would end up losing their soul and Paul's work would be in vain. 
So he uses intimidation through persecution. So again, the Lord or the devil wants to use obsessive sorrow for sin. He wants to use persecution or intimidation, but also he will twist the scripture. Again, we cite the example of Eve in the garden when Satan came to her and Eve had told the devil, God's command is don't touch the fruit lest you die. And in Genesis 3 verse 4, this is what the devil said, you will not surely die. The Lord said, you will die. The devil said, you will not die. He just added one word and changed the total meaning of it. So the devil will twist the scripture. He will twist the scripture in using false teachers to teach things that are contrary to the will of God, things that are supposedly right with God or that will make you more holy or that will make you closer to God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, 2 Peter 3, 16, it says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You see, there are people who will twist the scripture to their own destruction, but the false teachers twist it to your destruction, to my destruction, if we listen to them. The devil will twist the scripture. So we have to labor to know the truth so that when that scripture is twisted, we'll instantly recognize it. That's not what the Bible teaches. When we hear things that are taught by others, we need to compare that to what the word of God says so that we are not deceived by the lies of the devil as he twists the scripture. Then, of course, the devil will try to get us caught up in worldliness, in worldly things. He'll try to get us caught up in life and put our energy, our time, our effort on things of this world so that we don't have time for God. Well, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul gives us an admonition here that we need to keep our focus on heavenly things, on spiritual things. In Colossians 3 verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. You know, so many people, especially in our society, are caught up in the things of this world, are caught up in material things, are caught up in jobs, in hobbies, in sports. They're caught up in all kinds of things and leave God out of their life, or they push God to the very bare minimum that they would have to devote to him in their life. And he comes last in their priorities. You see this all the time. You can see this, if you will, just notice what happens in your neighborhood on Sunday morning when people are allowed to assemble, even though, you know, at sometimes under certain conditions in our society that has been altered, but even under normal circumstances on a Sunday morning, so few people are actually getting up and going to worship with others on the first day of the week. It's partly because they're caught up in the worldly things. Now, they might go fishing or they might go golfing or they might have sporting events that they take their children to at those exact same times, but they don't have time to devote to the Lord. And so it's a tool of the devil to get us caught up in all these things that in and of themselves are okay. There's a place in our life for sports and recreation and hobbies. And there's a place definitely for work and for earning to provide for our needs and to be a blessing to others. There's a place in our lives for that. But the devil wants us to be wholly consumed with those things so that our minds are not on heaven, but our minds are on the things on the earth. But we do not want to do that. The devil uses these tools against us. And because he is our enemy and the enemy of God. His end is destruction. His end is doom. In Revelation 19, verses 20 and 21, the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen with the devil. 
It says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the throne, on the horse, rather, and on the birds were filled with their flesh. All the birds were filled with their flesh. Christ is going to defeat Satan. His end is destruction. In Matthew 25, verse 41, it says, The devil and his angels will be cast into the everlasting fire of destruction. Now, the good news is that Christ has come and the gospel has been given that we may be free from Satan that we do not have to listen to his lies and we do not have to be intimidated by his persecution, but we can stand strongly and boldly before him and resist him and strongly and boldly with the Lord. So we encourage you, be determined that you're not going to go the path of destruction with the devil, but that you will turn to the Lord, seek him, make him your master, love him and serve him so that you will have a home in heaven. Thank you for watching this Bible study program brought to you by the Newton, North Carolina Church of Christ. If you do not live in the area but want to connect with a local group of Christians striving to follow the New Testament alone, then please contact us. While we are non-denominational and each congregation is independent, we have many personal contacts across the country and even around the world with which we can put you in touch. So just contact us and we will assist you in connecting with a local group of Christians. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com. You can call us at 828-465-3009. That's 828-465-3009. Or post a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, beginning, we read the parable of the tares. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You know, the parable of the tares is a very sobering and in some ways a very ominous passage as it is looking forward to the judgment when the Lord comes. The reality presented here is a very stark reality with which you and I need to come to grips and be ready for when that time comes. In Matthew chapter 13, later in this chapter here, verse 36 beginning, the disciples want to know what the tares means, what this parable means, and the Lord explains it to them in Matthew 13 verse 36 beginning. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reaper are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. 
The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, study this parable should drive us to a greater dedication to Christ, to the truth that he has revealed in his word, and to the kingdom that he established when he was on earth, and to resist the devil as he tries to get us to turn against our Savior. So let's break this parable down a little bit and notice what the Lord teaches within it and how we can have a better understanding and how we can have that greater dedication to him. So first of all, in 13 verse 38, it says the field is the world. Now, when you think about this, sometimes people get this field confused with the kingdom of God on earth, and that's not what he's talking about here. The kingdom of God is used basically in three senses or three ways in the Bible. The first, of course, is the church, that the church and the kingdom of God on earth and the gospel of age are one and the same thing. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, remember Jesus said this to Peter, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and so he's using church and kingdom interchangeably there. And that occurs in other places in the New Testament as well. But then there is the idea of an eternal kingdom of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. So there's the kingdom of God here on earth, which is the church. And then there is the eternal kingdom when we enter into eternity. But then there is also the sense in which kingdom, as far as God's rule or God's authority is used or concern, the kingdom is this world, just the entire world. In Psalm chapter 47, Psalm chapter 47 and notice verse 2 with me. Psalm 47, verse 2 says, For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. Then drop down to verse 7. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. So he rules and he reigns in this world. So there are three ways that kingdom is used. Again, the church is the kingdom of God. Christ is king over that. There is an eternal kingdom the Bible talks about. And then this sense in which God rules over all the earth. So that is a sense of the kingdom. And so when we look at the parable of the tares, and it talks about this sowing of the seed in the kingdom and there being tares in the kingdom. It's talking about the world because Jesus described in Matthew 13, verse 38, that the field in which this seed's being sown, the good seed and the bad seed, this field is the world. Now, another thing that we learn from this account in Matthew chapter 13 is that God limits his control over mankind. So there is good seed that's being sown in the world, but there's also bad seed being sown in the world. And that's the idea that the devil has some measure of authority, some measure of power in this world. He has the ability, the means to act in this world to affect and to impact mankind and to impact the events of this world. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, notice how Paul describes the devil's working in his life. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, Therefore, when we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered Paul. How did he do that? 
Well, the devil has some type of authority, some type of providence, if you will, in this world. He has some ability to work and to influence and impact the events in the lives of men. We know that he is an adversary working to destroy us, and it happens throughout the world as he's working to destroy us. But here's the thing about it. You and I have a choice. The Lord, through his servants, is sowing the good seed at the same time that the devil, through his servants, is sowing the bad seed. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so we understand that there's a choice there to believe or to not believe, to obey or not to obey. So we are affected by the devil but not against our free will. He puts temptations before us. He lies to us to try to get us to turn against God or to deny God's will in our life, to deny that God's power in our life or influence. But we have that choice, you see. So we can either hear the gospel, believe it and obey it, or we can reject that gospel and not obey it. Now, let's get to that idea of the gospel, of the seed that's being sown. There is the seed of the Word of God that's being sown in this world. Again, in Matthew chapter 13, notice the explanation of the parable. Matthew 13 and verse 37. He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Now, that's Jesus sowing the seed when he was personally here on earth, but also he sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth to go out and to preach that word. In Luke 8, Luke 8, verse 11, a, another parable is being explained, and it is explained, this is the parable of the soils, remember, the parable of the sower, as we often know it. It says, now, the seed is the word of God. So this seed that's being sown is that truth of the gospel that men are to be taught and they are to receive into their hearts and to serve God, allow that to impact them, to change their beliefs, to change their attitudes, to change their actions related to God and his will, to submit to God and his will. And the good seed, Matthew 13, 38 says, make sons of the kingdom. In James 1, verse 18, it says, we are begotten by the word of God. That seed has the power of life, that word. The word of God has the power of life within it. And as it is planted into our heart, it changes us and it will lead to a new birth in Christ. As we believe the gospel, as we are baptized into Christ, we become his children and we arise to walk in a new life. And let's understand that when it says in Matthew 13, 38, that this seed makes sons of the kingdom, that's all it will make. The seed makes Christians. Let's notice in Acts chapter 11. Acts 11 in verse 26, where it talks about Paul and Barnabas and them going around teaching and preaching the gospel. It says in Acts 11, verse 26, and when he had found him, that is, Barnabas had found Saul, as he is known in this case, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Christians. When somebody hears the seed of the gospel, they become a Christian, a son of the kingdom. The hearing the word of God and obeying it and believing it and following it, practicing what it teaches does not make us a member of a denomination. It cannot do that because there are no denominations in the Bible. So hearing the gospel and the gospel alone, that good seed, it doesn't make us a Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or anything like that. It makes us a Christian and a Christian alone, not any 
other thing. Let's understand that this happens, as the parable of the sower says, in good soil. If our heart's not right, then that word's not going to have power and impact. It's not going to lead us to be a son of the kingdom, but we will end up being the son of the wicked one. Now, the bad seed, as we have said, makes sons of the wicked one. And this bad seed comes about in many forms. In Romans chapter 1, Romans 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Yes, there are people who suppress the truth, who actively suppress it, who reject God out of their lives. In Romans 1 verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And because of this, they were given up to uncleanness. They didn't like to have God in their knowledge, and so they rejected God. This, of course, is talking about Gentiles in Old Testament times and how they got caught up in paganism and idolatry because of this. Well, the same thing happens today. If it's Buddhism, or it's Hinduism, or it's New Ageism, or it's Mohammedism, or it's atheism. All those things are essentially like the Old Testament idolatry. Caught up in the false doctrines of men, they reject the truth of God, and they follow their own passions and desires. Let's understand that that is the bad seed that produces tares, not the good seed that produces wheat. But there's also what the Bible describes as a perverted gospel. In Galatians 1, Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, read this with me and notice what it says. Galatians 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. You see, people pervert the gospel. They were doing it in the first century, and they're doing it still in the 21st century. They'll take and they'll twist the scripture. They'll add things in or they'll take things out in order to have a doctrine that pleases them. There are people who mix the old with the new. Remember in Galatians 5, verse 3, the apostle said this, And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You who have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. The context of that is there were people in the first century, Christians, who were going back and taking parts and pieces of the Old Testament law and trying to blend it in with the gospel of Christ. And that's the perverted gospel he's talking about. And so when people try to go back and take part of the old and mix it with the new, they have perverted the gospel, whether that's circumcision or a separate priesthood or observing the Sabbath or instrumental music in worship. All those things are things from the Old Testament and not things in the new. But people will try to blend those and thereby pervert the gospel of Christ. But there are those who simply try to pervert the new covenant, the new testament. In Second John, Second John, we want to read verses seven through ten, and notice what this says here. Second John two, or rather second John verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world 
who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The antichrist was around in the first century. The antichrist is still around today. That's people who are anti or against the Lord. Look to yourselves. What do you, what, uh, that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds." You see, there are people who corrupt the New Testament, who corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ. They do it on several things. Here, in this case, the specific example is there were people who denied that Jesus came in the flesh. That was false doctrine, false teaching. People who teach faith only salvation, that is error. People who teach that you can fellowship error, you can fellowship sin and still be right with God, is sinful. People who tell you that you can embrace immorality and still be right with God, that is error. That's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. And so there are those who pervert the gospel. There are those who pervert it by trying to mix the old with the new. There are those who pervert it by trying to simply change the new, add things to it or take things out of it that the Lord does not authorize. This is the bad seed that is sown by the enemy that produces tares instead of wheat. And there are only two types of seed, if you will, and only two crops produced. There's the good seed and then there's bad seed. There's only two ways, one of two ways to go. We are either with the Lord or we are against the Lord. There's no in between. We are either a son of the kingdom or a son of the wicked one. Let's notice Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6 as it talks about these ones, if you will. Just a brief note here. Ephesians 4 verse 4, there is one body in one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Do you notice the ones there? They're singing, there's one body that in the context talking about one church. That's it. There's only one. That's the church of Jesus Christ. There's only one spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one revelator of truth. There's not many sources of truth, but only one source of truth, the Holy Spirit. There's one hope of your calling. That's heaven. That's it. There's only one Lord, only one Savior, only one Jesus Christ. Only one. There are not many saviors. There's only one Savior. And there's only one faith. That's not talking about one belief. It's talking about one system of faith. There's only one. There are not many there's one. There's only one baptism for the remission of sins. There's only one God and Father. There are not many gods and fathers. So there's only one kingdom. There's only one law. There's only one Savior. There's only one king over that kingdom. And so we need to believe in that one gospel. That's the good seed. The bad seed tells you there are many different bodies. There are many different sources of revelation or sources of authority. There are many different beliefs or faiths that are acceptable to God. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Now, the final thing we want to notice out of the parable of the tares is that judgment is coming. In fact, that really is the point of the entire parable in a broad sense that there's this judgment coming in which there's going to be a separation of the righteous from the unrighteous. There is a judgment coming when the Lord will send his angels, who are the reapers, and they'll gather the tares together and cast them into the fire. But then the righteous ones will shine forth as the sun. The idea is they're going to be transported to heaven to be with God in eternity. And this judgment, let's understand, is coming suddenly. And with surprise, it's coming with a fierceness and it's going to overwhelm us. And it's going to be one that 
is final. There's not going to be anything after that. Therefore, you and I need to make sure that our life is right with the Lord now. We encourage you to reflect on the parable of the tares and to determine that you need to dedicate your life to Christ, to be devoted to him, to embrace and accept his truth, holding on to it and not allowing the enemy to come and to sow that tear, that bad seed in your heart to cause you to turn from God and in the end to be doomed. So let us help you do this. Contact us and we'll be happy to study with you personally that you may have a better understanding of the will of God, that you may build your strength, your faith to serve him so that in the end, you will be a son of the kingdom and you will shine forth with him in eternity as the sun. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His plan for saving man, or the church that Jesus established? Then please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin or to receive a copy of the outlines of our lessons on this program. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that phone number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. And we have classes for all ages, so bring the whole family. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information, once more, is the phone, 828-465-3009. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com or go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword or go to our website word and sword.com that's word a n d sword.com and our address once again is 656 st james church road newton north carolina again we thank you for watching and please feel free to reach out with your bible questions I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father and I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou